Okay, very nice. So, thank you everyone and welcome uh, uh, to the March uh, Science Cafe. Uh, this Science Cafe uh, is uh, um, about a new topic. The title is The Microcosm Within Us. And the speaker that we are honored to have here is, is docent Leo Lahti from the Department of Mathematics and Statistics. As usual, for those of you who are new to Science Cafe, we will first have uh, the talk of the speaker uh, for about half an hour, 40 minutes. Uh, after this, we will have uh, questions and answers. And after the questions and answers, I hope that Leo will stay with us for a while, uh, maybe until 7. We have this room until 7. And if you want, you can no go and talk to him and ask him questions uh, about uh, what he's talking about and about his research. Um, and I think probably we are ready to go. And thank you very much, uh, Leo. The floor is yours. OK, thank you very much for the invitation to speak here. Um, I have to, I hope everybody sees the screen, although I have to stand here because of the arrangements. Um, let me know if, if I have to be in some other place. Anyway, um, as Sabrina mentioned, I'm a mathematician actually, not a biologist. However, I ended up giving a talk about microbiological research because this is an area where I have been working on, on the last couple of years, uh, on the human gut microbiome research especially. And uh, why this is? It's a uh, really mathematically heavy area that where a lot of data is being generated. It's a complex ecosystem where we need a lot of mathematical modeling and tools. Uh, I'm not getting into much detail there, but I try to more uh, like give an overview of gut microbiome research today. So our planet is, is full of microbes. And um, if we go back in time, we can ask where this life originated from. And uh, there is this panspermia hypothesis that uh, suggests, it has been suggested already in ancient Greece, that life may have been originating in the space, actually. Um, we do not really know if this is true or not. Um, but there is some evidence that living particles, microbial particles, are also potentially found in, in cos cosmic clouds. At least there are some organic molecules there that can uh, help life arise on our planet if, if it lands there. So we do not really know where the life uh, originated from, but we do know uh, that it was about four billion years ago that the first microbial organisms appeared on, on the planet Earth. The exact timing is not known, but uh, we know it's about four billion years. And actually, for the majority of the history of this time of our planet, it has been only colonized by microbes. Uh, for the first two or three billion years, only microbes were living on Earth. And after that, multicellular organisms started to evolve, uh, and ultimately humans. And uh, because this microbial life is so enormously important for our, uh, our planetary climate and ecosystems, every life form that has evolved on Earth had to adapt to live in symbiosis with microbial organisms. Uh, so every, every single uh, larger organism ha had to find ways to cope with the microbial invasions and potentially live in a beneficial relation with them. And um, of course, there was a long way to go uh, when Antonio van Leeuwenhoek um, came up with the microscope in the 17th century. And the first observations, direct observations of microbial life are from the 17th century uh, with some microscopes that he designed that could uh, magnify uh, the visibility for a couple of hundreds of times. And um, so this was very pioneering work. He was a Dutch scientist uh, at the time. It was a golden era of Dutch science of technology where a lot of these kind of inventions uh, came up. And this, this was the first time that uh, my microbes were discovered. Um, and after some initial skepticism, it was widely accepted uh, that microbes exist. And um, if we look at human microbiome, this was one of the things that Leeuwenhoek actually reported first, uh, that humans have microbes, humans carry microbes. 
So we are also vessels for microbial life. Every human being is carrying about one or two kilograms of microbial biomass. And uh, even though this one or two kilograms sounds small, it actually contains more bacterial cells than we have our own cells. We have about 30% more bacterial cells than we have our own cells. And if we look at the unique genetic content of this microbial biomass, they, they carry hundreds of times more unique genes that we carry in our own genome. That gives some idea about the genetic potential of, of this system in our body. Um, so it's a, it's a huge functional part of our body, a huge part of our metabolism and health. And um, it is very little understood currently how these microbial organisms affect our health. Um, and in addition to bacteria, there are also other organisms. There is a lot of viruses, there is yeasts, there is uh, bigger parasites, all kinds of things uh, living in our body and on our body. And uh, this, uh, this microbial life is also transmitted through generations in, in families or if we people live together or from uh, domestic animals to humans and so forth. So the living environment affects drastically what kind of microbial balance we have. And uh, one difference of the microbial ecosystems compared to our own genome is that this is something you can actually change over the, over the lifetime. So we can make choices like dietary choices or choices on exercise or choices on where we live. Uh, and all this will affect the microbial balance in all over our body. There is a fig figure um, about the human being there and it uh, kind of shows us that different parts of the human body have very different microbial um, compositions. So gut microbiome is, for instance, very different from uh, skin microbiome. Okay. And um, now uh, the right balance of these microbial ecosystems is very important. So uh, there is a summary of different types of microbes that we can carry. So actually, most microbes that we carry are beneficial for our health, or at least not harmful. And they are called symbionts or commensals. They live with us and they are not harmful for us, but they have been adapting to live with us. And then there is a smaller number of so-called pathobionts that can be harmful for our health. And now if we try to treat pathobionts or disease by killing these pathobiotic bacteria, we may also disturb the healthy ecosystems. And this might also have um, bad con consequences for our health. And if we look at the gut microbiome, for instance, there is 300 square meters of area in our gut surface where these microbes live in. So it's a lot of space for these microbes to thrive and live. And the balance is, uh, is sometimes very intricate. But um, what are good or bad, bad microbes? This is, of course, not always so simple question. Actually, there is no bad microbes or good <coughs> microbes, but it's all about the balance and it depends on the context. So uh, one very prominent example is uh, Helicobacter pylori. And this is a single bacterial species that has been associated with gastric cancer. So if you have this bug, then you are more likely to get gastric cancer later in your life. And uh, some tens of percent of, of this population carries this bacteria. Many of us, many of people in this room actually are carriers of this bacteria. It does not mean that you get uh, gastric cancer in the end, but it makes you more susceptible for that. But at the same time, this bacterial bug is now less common in uh, Western populations nowadays because of the modernization of the lifestyle. So we are getting rid of it. But this is not necessarily good because this, it has been found out that if you have this bacteria, especially if you have it as a child, it can help and protect you from uh, allergies and uh, related diseases. So this bacteria is an example of uh, bacteria where it can have both beneficial and uh, harmful effects. But actually, in most of the studies that we are carrying, we are not interested in individual bacteria. We are interested in ecosystems of bacteria. So a uh, normal human gut microbiota contains some hundreds of bacterial species. Every adult human carries maybe 500 different unique bacterial species uh, in fecal material. And, um, and um, 
So the overall balance of the ecosystem is important, not necessarily any individual bacterial group that you find from the gut. And uh, this uh, figure in this slide shows the effect of antibiotic treatment on the uh, diversity of the microbiome. And uh, diversity measures how many different types of bacterial species you see in the gut ecosystem. Diversity is a typical measure in ecosystems to measure how rich the ecosystem is. And uh, the first plot is uh, showing the diversity in a normal healthy adult. And then uh, they receive broad spectrum antibiotics and the diversity is dropped because many bacteria die in the gut ecosystem and then it starts to slowly recover and in this figure we see um, that um, after about half a year the diversity has mostly recovered but not really uh, on the original level. This may be something for the adults but uh, especially for babies this can be drastic because baby microbiome is uh, it's a really vulnerable state of life when our whole body and physiology is still developing. And if we disturb this microbial balance in babies, this can have drastic con consequences for later health. And um, on this bar plot on the right, uh, you see the risk for developing inflammatory diseases of the gut later in life as a function of antibiotic treatments as a child. And you can see that the more antibiotic cures you have as a child, the more likely it is that later in life you will develop some kind of uh, disease of inflammatory bowel disease or, or other inflammatory disease of the gut. So um, microbiome is developing over the lifetime. This shows uh, the microbial diversity as a function of age. So um, in babies, in young children, the microbial diversity is coming up very rapidly because they collect all kinds of microbes from the environment. In adults, the typical diversity of the microbiome is uh, more or less stable, although there is a lot of individual variation. Each point on this map is one adult, and how high the point is shows how high the diversity of the microbes in this adult is. On the x-axis, you have the age. And uh, one notable thing is this figure is that in adult population we have a subset of people who have reduced levels of microbial diversity. And uh, this is not always, uh, always uh, associated with bad health because all these people in this figure are healthy. But it can be sometimes associated with obesity for instance. In obese people uh, typically the microbial diversity is reduced. And the point size shows the body mass index of these individuals. So the bigger points are bigger people. And you can see that the uh, diversity is reduced uh, more in the obese population. So as I mentioned, uh, the uh, H. pylori as one example of potentially harmful or good bug. In Western countries in the couple of last decades, many infectious diseases have decreased dramatically. And we are in general more healthy in many ways than previously. We are not getting these infectious diseases uh, so often, like hepatitis, salmonella, and so forth. But at the same time, many inflammatory diseases, cancers, allergies, autoimmune diseases, autism, and uh, other things have gone up at a rapid pace. And um, many of these changes have been linked to the changes in gut microbiome. And this may have something to do with the changes in the Western lifestyle. Uh, our, our dietary habits have changed dramatically in the last couple of decades. We live in much more hygiene environments. We use a lot, lot more medications and antibiotics and, and so forth. So that's the motivation why we actually are interested in studying the gut microbial ecosystem. We want to know what is its effect on health and how we might potentially be able to manipulate it by changing the lifestyle. But of course, measurement is the starting point for all these studies. So um, if we look uh, for a moment how we measure the gut microbiome, a very typical way to measure the gut microbiome is to collect fecal material. And uh, we have a lot of volunteers, thousands of volunteers actually, who donate their fecal material for science. And uh, they have instructions how to do this at home. And similar uh, projects are going on in different parts of the planet at the moment. And the nice thing about the fecal uh, material is that it's very easy to collect. It comes out and you can just collect it. Uh, the, the drawback is that it is actually a mixture of many different things because if you look at the top corner, 
uh, the actually our gut is uh, very long. It's uh, several meters long, uh, long gastrointestinal tract. And in different parts of this uh, line, you can have very different microbes living. And uh, if we take fecal material, it's only a limited window to all these different things that are happening in the overall gastrointestinal tract. There are other ways. I have seen my colleague, for instance, swallowing a tube uh, in, his, in her mouth, and uh, it came out from the other end. And this way, they can actually collect microbes from all, all over the gastrointestinal tract. But as you can imagine, this is not a very convenient way of collecting the samples. <laughs> And it's not very easy to get volunteers, at least in large scale, for these kind of things. Other way is to open the stomach and uh, collect the material. But as you can see, the fecal material is, uh, is nice. And, um, and one other thing we have to do, we have to score it based on this Bristol stool chart, which basically tells how consistent or how liquid the stool is, because this is one of the things that affects the interpretation of the experiments. And traditionally, uh, once we collected these samples, we could only study bacteria that we can culture in a petri dish. And actually, it's a minority ba of bacteria. There is most of the bacteria, we do not know how, how to nurture them on a petri dish. We don't know how to feed them and what to give so that they can live there. Uh, and in the recent years, uh, we, uh, high throughput DNA sequencing technologies have revolutionized the field and now you can actually measure the DNA of the sample without knowing or how to, how to treat the bacteria there. So you can just measure all the DNA and see what kind of things are living there. And that's, uh, that's one of the mathematical puzzles. And the prices have come down a lot. When I started to do science maybe 15 years ago, the sequencing of the human genome was about 100 million dollars. And uh, now it's some couple of hundreds of dollars. So it has come down a lot. And uh, human genome um, is much smaller than the bacterial com composition of our body. So now, because of this dramatic price decrease, we can uh, measure these systems at large scale. And we can really start to measure the whole bacterial composition of the human body. And what, one thing that we see is that we should not only look at what kind of bacteria we have, we should also look at what they do. So what kind of metabolic functions they carry and how they are active. And we actually see in, in many recent studies that the bacterial composition varies a lot between different people. So bacterial composition in any individual is as unique as a fingerprint. But if we look at what these bacteria do, many of the bacteria can do very similar things. And this way, um, uh, they, they carry very similar functions for our body, even if our bacterial load is different. That's also important, and we have to measure that. And uh, we have started to investigate these things, for instance, in the context of a Finnish study. We, um, we have this uh, study by Finnish National Institute for Health, which is carried uh, every, every couple of years. And uh, in 2002, they carried out this population cohort study also, and they collected fecal material from 7,000 Finnish adults all over the country. Uh, they were middle-aged adults, and uh, they were randomly chosen. So it's a nice cohort, because now we can look uh, 15 years later what happens for these individuals. And if their gut microbiome in 2002 could predict the development of their health later on. Similar studies have been done in many other countries. And uh, typically, we see um, these kind of plots when we start to summarize the data. So if we ask how the Finnish population is um, distributed in terms of microbial composition, so this is what you see on this map. So every point on this map is one individual. And uh, the proximity of the points on this map shows how similar microbial community these individuals have. This is uh, one way to visualize very high dimensional information on two dimensions. And uh, what we can see from here is that there is, for instance, a group of green individuals um, that is having very similar bacteria. And then there is the other group of, uh, of uh, red indi individuals, who, and they have a different microbial composition. So basically, Finnish population seems to split in two different types of people. Um, one of them have high 
levels of Prevotella. Prevotella is uh, one bacteria, it's the green group. Prevotella is a very, very abundant bug in our guts, but only some people have that. And then the other group is uh, consisting of people that do not have Prevotella. And the color is actually showing the dominating bacteria in the guts of each of these people. And you can see that few bacterial species dominate the overall ecosystem. So this just gives an overview of the Finnish population and how similar microbes they have. And each of us would be located on one point of this map, which would tell how we relate to other people in terms of our gut microbiome composition. We see very similar things in other cohorts. This is a similar study from Belgium, where I uh, did some research some years. And it's called Flemish Cut Flower Project. So we see a similar type of population level distribution. Some people have high Prevotella, others have lower Prevotella. But what we also see, there is this uh, red group of people who have very, very high levels of uh, one bacterial species called Bacteroides. And it seems that these people who are on this uh, area of the landscape of bacterial communities, they seem to have uh, compromised health. They have more inflammatory bowel disease. So this gives hints how, uh, how bacterial composition may determine our health or at least influence it. And if we start to study these systems, we need to use a lot of different approaches from ecological studies. And of course, uh, there is a long tradition in ecological studies about alternative stable states in ecosystems and so forth. So now we can transfer many of the methods from earlier ecological studies to the context of human gut microbiome research. And um, some of these phenomena include immigration from the meta community, alternative stable states of the system, and um, influenced by external variables and so forth. So there is a lot of different things that we have to take into account systematically when analyzing and studying these systems. And all these things may have an effect on how to manipulate these. There are also many different competing ecological theories and we have to make sense, uh, sense, on, sense for instance on whether the bacteria have interactions or if they are competing each, each other and, and so forth. Um, okay, I was talking about the westernization. So the effect of the modern lifestyle. And uh, there has been a lot of recent research recently uh, on non-western populations in, in the last a couple of the first years of microbiome research, it was heavily focusing on Western populations. Um, but now we are get, starting to have more and more samples from rural areas, from uh, Peru, from uh, African villages, and uh, from many other places. And uh, what we can actually see is that, um, for instance, people from United States seem to have very different microbial composition than people, for, for, for instance, from Peru or Malawi who are living in more rural regions. And uh, this is on the top, top corner, uh, the similarity of the microbial communities. A little bit similar figure than I showed earlier for the Finnish people. And then the, the big fig figure here shows the microbial diversity as a function of age. And the color of the points shows the country of origin for these people. So the, the blue points are people from the United States. And the green and red points are people from rural areas in Peru and Malawi. And um, you can actually see from this figure that American people tend to have lower diversity of the gut microbiome. <coughs> so the microbi microbiome composition is more poor. They have less different types of microbial species. And um, they have uh, also probably domination by some microbial species. So this might explain some of the differences uh, in the health status, status of the Western and other populations. And very simple things such as dietary, uh, dietary components can affect this microbial composition a lot. In Finland, it was also studied in the context of uh, skin microbiome at the Russian border, where they, um, Ilka Hanski's group, they took samples from the Finnish side of the border and Russian side of the border from people's skin microbiome. And on the Finnish side of the border, we have uh, several times more allergies and inflammatory diseases than on the Russian side of the border. And they could link this uh, with skin microbiome composition. We, we also studied this uh, in the context of uh, gut microbiome composition. So it is, uh, it is well known that colon cancer is um, 
very prevalent in westernized countries, but colon cancer is much less common in, uh, in rural areas. And we wanted to investigate whether this has some link to microbes. It is already known that the diet has a lot of effect on colon cancer development, uh, but microbes are the potential link between the diet and cancer development. So we took people from the United States and a Tanzanian village, and we switched their diets for two weeks. Here is the amount of colon cancer in different uh, parts of the globe. So the red, red areas are areas where we have a lot of col colon cancer. Colon cancer is 10 times more common in the United States than it is in most regions in Africa. So uh, when we took these people from the African village, uh, we were looking at what kind of um, diets they have. And they have a much less meat and they have much uh, more <coughs> vegetables, especially fiber-rich vegetables in their diet. And uh, the lower figure shows what kind of bacteria these guys have. So people from the United States have a much more bacteroides species. People from this Tanzanian village have much more prevatal species. And this has a lot to do with dietary habits. It's not genetic because actually the people that we took from the United States have the same genetic background. They are immigrants for one, one or two generations ago. So the only, only, only explanatory factor is the lifestyle of these people. And the diet is, is a remarkable lifestyle, lifestyle variable. So we changed the diet for two weeks for these people. And what we see is uh, that there was a huge increase in bacteria uh, that produce short-chain fatty acids. And these are known to be beneficial. These, uh, they, they have anti-carcinogenic properties. They are anti-inflammatory. So those people who received this Tanzanian diet got more of these good bacteria. But not only that, these bacteria also started to produce more short-chain fatty acids that are beneficial. Uh, and at the same time, they got uh, less bacteria, people with African diet, they got less bacteria that produce bile acids. And bile acids are known to be carcinogenic and inflammatory. So those who received the Tanzanian rural diet, they got less of the risk factor, which comes from the meat that uh, feeds the bad bacteria. And they got more protection that comes from the good bacteria that generate the short-chain fatty acids. So there is a double effect of protection and risk. And of course, in the United States population, it goes the other way around. They got more of the risk factor from the meat and less of the protection for, from the short chain fatty acids. And already after two weeks, we saw significant changes in the colon cancer risk of these people. Um, so it, it gives a kind of mechanistic link on how diet may affect the colon cancer risk. And of course, this was just one study between um, two populations. We could expand this. There is considerations now if we could expand it to Eskimos, because they eat even less vegetables and more meat. People from Savo, for instance, eat uh, extremely high levels of fiber in global comparison. And then we have this Stephen O'Keefe, who just goes on uh, to collect this fecal material from different populations to help these studies. So dietary intervention is one way how we can affect the gut microbiome. There is also other ways to affect the gut microbiome, and fecal transplants have become a hot topic recently. And fecal transplants refer to um, really transplants of fecal material. So we can take, uh, take fecal material from a healthy donor and transmit to somebody else, potentially a non-healthy non person. And actually, what we can see in this, uh, th this is a study uh, that shows uh, antibiotic treatment versus uh, fecal transplant treatment. And there is one bacterial bug, which is called Clostridium difficile, which can become very dominant, and it's causing antibiotic diarrhea. So if you eat a lot of antibiotics in hospital, you may um, get so poor ecosystem in your gut that suddenly this one nasty bug comes and takes over, and it can be as uh, prevalent as 50% of every bacterial species in your gut. So this one nasty bug can really dominate our gut ecosystem, and these people are seriously ill. It's a life-threatening condition. They have a severe antibiotic diarrhea, and it's, it's a very difficult to treat, because even if you erase this bacterial uh, form with antibiotics, 
it typically this is the first bug that comes af uh, comes back first after the antibiotics treatment. So antibiotics do not really help. But one reason why antibiotics does not help is that we just take everything out, but we do not put anything in. And uh, one way to do this treatment is to actually erase the system, do some flushes, and then put healthy, micro uh, healthy material in, healthy fecal material, which contains a rich and healthy ecosystem. So we replace the sick ecosystem with the healthy one. And this is called fecal transplant. And um, we can see that already after um, some days, the diversity, diversity of the microbial system is restored to the healthy levels in these people who get the fecal transplant. So there is the donor on the first plot and then um, the patient on the, on the right. And you can see how the patient diversity is restored. And the nice thing about this is that it's much better than antibiotics. Actually, when they, they carried out the study, they wanted to compare how efficient the fecal transplant is compared to the antibiotics. And it turns out that 90% of the people get uh, permanently healthy with this fecal transplant, and only 30% 30, 30 of the people get healthy with antibiotics. And uh, this uh, turned out to be so drastic effect that they had to quit the study because it would have been unethical to continue treating the people with antibiotics because this fe uh, fecal transplant was so much more eff effective and these people were really sick. Actually, this fecal transplant, it's, it's not a new invention. It start, uh, there started to be studies in the 50s, uh, scientific studies about fecal transplants, but it has been known um, since uh, millennia, actually already in ancient China, <coughs> about 300 uh, around the year 300, uh, a guy called uh, Ge Hong, uh, he, he reported this uh, fecal material uh, transmit to humans. Uh, he prepared drinks with fecal, fecal water and he gave this to people who were ill in some ways. And in many cultures, fecal, uh, fecal drinks have been given for animals, for instance, to, to treat all kinds of things. So it's not really a new invention. It has been uh, being used for uh, centuries in different contexts, but now we are starting to have more scientific understanding of the fecal transplants. But of course, it's not a simple thing to do because um, we do not know much about the long-term consequences of fecal material. Of course, it can make you healthy, but we, there is a lot of different bacteria in the fecal material. There is a thousand different uh, bacterial bugs there. So actually, if you tr transmit fecal material to somebody else, we do not really know what other things they do. They may make you healthy in the short term, but maybe in the longer run, they might also make you sick in some other way. And not much of this is known. Uh, so the ecosystem is very complex, and there is now a lot of studies. If we could reduce this to a few bacterial species or a pill, that would be more safe to give for people. And of course, because this has become famous treatment, there is now a lot of people who want to do it yourself, kind of home. You can go to YouTube, you see videos on, on instructions on how you can do fecal transplants at home. So it's not really recommended because of these uh, health issues that are not very well understood. So you have to control pretty well who you take this fecal transplant from. And people may also, like we have different blood types. We also don't know, we are not sure if we have different fecal material types. So if you take fecal material from somebody, if it's suitable for you or not, we do not really know. So it's important to keep these things in mind. Okay, and uh, about mind, actually, there is one <laughs> more topic I wanted to mention, and it's the so-called psychopions. Gut, gut brain axis is one very hot topic nowadays. We are studying it in Turku, for instance, in the context of the thin brain study, where we studied the cognitive development in babies and how gut microbiome might be linked to that. And um, so in the re last couple of years, it has uh, been reported uh, widely in the scientific literature that the microorganisms that live in our gut they are producing hundreds of different neurochemically active molecules that go to bloodstream and ultimately to our, our, our brain. And for instance, majority of the serotonin in our bodies is located in the gut. Um, so there is a lot of different bacterial species that produce uh, neurochemicals. And uh, there have been animal studies 
Sometimes it's unethical to study these things in humans, really, to give uh, all these treatments. So uh, it's easier to study in mice. And one example is that uh, there are two different strains of mice. One is a shy strain of mice. They are not very active and they are uh, afraid of many things. And then there is another other strain of mice which is brave and they want to explore the environment and wander around a lot. And uh, they have different bacterial compositions in the gut as well. So there was a study where they actually switched the gut microbiome or the fecal material of the mice. And it turned out that also their behavior changed. So those mice that were shy before, they became much more active and wanted to explore the environment and, and, and the other way around. It has also been found that um, these uh, fecal transplants in mice can induce obesity or, or treat obesity. So actually by taking uh, fecal things in humans, but it's potentially have effects on our mind and mood. Okay. But so microbiome science has been a hot topic recently. And uh, there is a lot of open questions. Uh, it's complicated systems, and we need to be skeptical about what we study. Not much is understood. To be honest, we do not even know how healthy microbiome looks like. We know much about the disease associations, but we know very little about what is actually healthy and how we can change these systems. So with that, I wanted to close. and. Um, of course, this kind of research, it's very multidisciplinary. I, I would never have a chance to do this alone. So we need people who collect the data. Uh, I have given many examples of studies that have been done by other colleagues. Uh, I tried to provide references where possible. So there is a huge list of collaborators, and I'm heavily thankful for all, to all of them, but especially for my uh, small research group in University of Turku. There is also some popular writings there. And if you are interested and can read Finnish, I would like to recommend one book by Pentti Huovinen, who is the Dean of Medical Faculty at the moment. He has written this uh, Dancing with Bacteria, Tansi Bacteria and Cancer, which is a popularized book about microbes. Thank you very much. This was a very interesting talk. Uh, and I've learned a lot of things that I didn't know, actually. And I'm sure that there will be a lot. Uh, and I will try to um, to uh, find out. There is a lot of people. Okay, we begin there. And please do use the microphone. Uh, it's not because it's amplified, but it's because of the re recording. And this is working, right? Yes. Okay. So, uh, is it working? Okay. Okay. So I am a vegan myself, and I would like know if uh, is there any studies on how vegan diet can impact on our microbiome I just wanted to show this because it's um, it's a little bit more more, more concrete. So um, it is known that the dietary well diet is actually one of the most important things that is driving the microbiome. And we did this uh, diet swap study between the people from Tanzania and people from United States. And there we saw that uh, people from Tanzanian village who have more uh, vegetarian-based diet, 
they have a more prevotal species, for instance, and prevotal is this uh, one green group there. Those people have high levels of prevotal. So if you are vegan, you are very likely to be in this green group of people in this map. But of course, it's not, uh, it's not really deterministic. You may be somewhere else, but it's very likely that you are there. So if you read, eat about a lot of vegetables, then you have certain kinds of bacteria, and prevotal is one of them. And then you have fewer of bacteroides and some other species. Onko tämä päällä? Joo, Ari Hinkkainen, tuota, kiitos Leo. Se oli hieno esitys ja tuota, teki oikein vaikutuksen syvästi. Ja tuota, nyt pari juttua. Ensiksi tuota, tämmöinen, kun sä näytit nämä hiiret, nämä laihat ja lihavat hiiret, niin mä satuin näkemään eräänä päivänä tämmöisen ohjelman, oliko sitten YouTube vai missä oli, mutta tuota, äiti oli sairastanut tämä Clostridium difficile infektion ja tuota, oli hyvin, hyvin vakava. Hän sai tyttäreltään tämmöisen fekaalitransplantaation. Äiti oli silloin, kun oli normaali tilassa, hän oli hyvin hoikka. Tytär oli melko lailla tällainen runsaammin varustettu painolla. Ja tuota, nyt äiti sai tämän fekaalitransplantaation. Muutaman kuukauden päästä äiti parani, mutta kuinka kävikään? Äitistäkin tuli lihava. Se oli tämä vaan, että tämä oli anekdootti sillä tavalla, se oli yksittäistä pausta. Toinen kysymys. Niin tuota, diabetesinsidenssi on Suomessa maailman korkein, ykköstyypin diabetesinsidenssi. Virossa se on alhainen. Se oli aiemmin vielä paljon alhaisempi. Onko sun tiedossa mitä tutkimuksia, jotka tutkisivat nyt virolaisten vanhoja näytteitä ja suomalaisten ja vertailisivat tätä mikrobiota? Joo. Shall I answer in Finnish or English? Um, I, 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 I don't know. Uh, if, she, if you answer in English, will you, he understand? Uh, yeah, he will. Uh, I, okay. I, think I will answer in English. If you can answer in English, yeah. but can you briefly summarize, like in two words? I in, will. Uh, yes, thanks. Okay, in your answer. Yeah. So there was a question on uh, diabetes incidence in Finland. Diabetes is, uh, uh, it's, Finland is one of the countries where diabetes is most prevalent uh, in our world. And uh, in Estonia, which is uh, close by and similar in many ways, there is much less diabetes. And the question was if there are studies in Estonian samples um, where we see this and, um, and how this could be related to gut microbiome. Actually, for diabetes exactly, I, I am not sure how much that is being studied in Estonia at the moment. But, but there have been studies, for instance, by Ilkka Hanskis group, where they have been comparing the microbiomes of Finnish and Estonian and Russian people. And the interesting thing is that uh, when you compare Finnish and Russian populations, you see that uh, in Finland we have much more of these uh, diseases like diabetes and other, un uh, other uh, autoimmune diseases in Russia less. But in Estonia, uh, it starts to grow in the 90s when the country starts to modernize. And since the 90s, these diseases have been increasing in Estonia as well. And, and uh, diabetes has been definitely linked to the gut microbiome composition. For instance, in this co Finnish cohort, uh, which I showed, this Finnish cohort, uh, collected in 2002, um, this is a random population. So actually, out of these 7,000 adults, many of them developed diabetes in this 15-year follow-up that we have. And we are now starting to be able, we did not do that yet, but we are going to do these kind of things. So uh, you can have a look how gut microbiome at some point of time will uh, predict if you will get diabetes later. In Estonia, there is definitely not such a big population studies on, on this kind of material at the moment, but they are collecting and we have connections with Estonian people who do this research. Okay, let's see it now. Hi, I actually have so many questions. Thank you for the interesting talk, um, but I will try to summarize from somewhere. Is it, um, can I summarize it so that um, most often you might have a perfectly good gut microbiota, 
but you can take a lot of antibiotics or eat poorly and that will ruin your microbiota. However, is it also possible that you are simply born with a very bad gut microbiota? Because I'm thinking, um, yeah, I'm thinking, is it always one way or can it also be the other way? And then I'm wondering the connection to, for example, the autoimmune diseases that you were talking about, because of course there are families that have more, what did you mention, MS and um, of course Crohn's disease. That, that was the, I think you had it before actually. So I'm, I'm wondering if, for example, if you have these, I guess you have some kind of genetic components in these as well, but would it be possible to do studies in these families, or maybe they have already been done, where you would change the microbiota of these um, family members and then see that some of those genetic things that make you prone to the diseases not to actually get activated or, or not. So I don't know, that was a lot of things. Did you maybe catch my point? Thank you. Uh, it's, of course, a very relevant question how microbes are transmitted in families and how this might affect disease susceptibility later. Um, and there is a lot of studies that try to make sense of this. Uh, as you mentioned, many diseases are multifactorial, so there is a lot of different uh, things that influence, like genetics, microbiome, environment, a lot of different things. Um, microbiome is really variable. And the question was, first question was if you could be born with a bad microbiome. But um, actually at the moment um, there is a strong hypothesis that you only receive the microbial load after the birth. Um, it is heavily debated and there is, it's, it's not really uh, shown. It, it is actually possible that we receive some microbes already before we are born. But to start with, once we are born, we, we are born with a very, very few microbes, and most of the material we collect from the environment after the, after the birth. Of course, the first, uh, first booms come from the vaginal microbiome. So when a child is born, uh, we get a few, huge flush of vaginal microbiome, and this uh, actually is shown to affect uh, for some time the development of the microbiome. If you are born with cesarean section, then uh, it affects uh, the development of your microbiome for a moment. And uh, one thing with children is that children, especially very young babies, they have very different types of microbiomes. This, is the, so this shows the microbial uh, diversity as a function of age. And actually one thing that you can see in babies, although the resolution is not, not very good here, is that the babies have a highly variable microbial diversity. So babies are very, very different from each other. And uh, when they get older, the microbial composition becomes more similar. So, so the adults are much more similar between each other in terms of the microbes that they carry than, than babies. Um, so if a baby is found, uh, found or born with a bad microbiome, it's difficult to say, but it's for sure that um, the babies will collect a lot of microbes from, from the environment. So if you are born in a hospital environment, you will certainly collect different types of microbes than in, if you are born in a rural village. And uh, this certainly has an effect on, on the development of the microbiome. And it, we know that microbiome, microbiome has some effect on our physiological development and cognitive development and so forth. But this is not very well understood because these systems are so individual and highly variable that we need really huge sample sizes and these population level cohorts where we can have thousands of people or even ten, tens of thousands of people to study this. And this is why we do not have that much uh, real knowledge yet. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if I under, uh, answered everything. I, there was still this question about the familial, uh, familial inheritance. So yes, this is one of the things that we do not know, th how, how the microbes transmit disease. And yeah, as, as we see from the mouse studies, uh, you can, by switching the microbes, the mouse can become lean or it can become happy. The, the, we heard this story about that something similar can happen in humans. So um, these things do have effect. It's just a matter of quantifying them and understanding them more deeply. Okay, so more questions? Yes. Hello, thank you for a very interesting talk. I don't know if my question goes a bit off the topic, 
but you showed the data about the two week sort of rapid onset sw uh, switching of the diets. Uh, did you look at any metabolic, other metabolic features during that time? Or did you carry on the study sort of to see if the, after they switch back to their regular diet, how long the effect of the diet can be seen in their gut microbiota? All oh, right, okay. Um, we were looking at very limited number of things. We were looking at, uh, on metabolites, we were only looking at short chain fatty acids. Different types, though. We were looking at propionate, butyrate, and, and some other things that um, are listed in the paper. <laughs> and then <laughs> we were looking at bile acids. Uh, that's pretty much it. And then we were looking at colon cancer biomarkers like cell proliferation, Ka67, and some uh, known biomarkers of colon cancer. Uh, so that's about it. Because it was a really a conceptual study that by doing a diet swap, swap uh, or switch, you can uh, induce these kind of changes. And there, of course, uh, this could be expanded in many ways. We could expand much more rich <coughs> variety of metabolites. We could try different types of diets and, and so forth, but all that is future studies. Um, and regarding the long-term consequences of the diet, um, that is actually pretty interesting topic nowadays, because if, uh, if you can change somebody's microbiome with diet, Sometimes ecosystems have these alternative stable states so that if you can push the system in one place, it will stay there. So even if you change your diet back to the original thing, it could be that um, your new microbiome will just happily stay where it, it became to be. So we, um, we have some, some uh, information on this. For instance, vegetarian diet promotes the growth of Prevotella species. So people who eat a lot of vegetarian food, they are more likely to have this Prevotella type in the gut. And we know actually from our data that Prevotella is a pretty stable, uh, stable type. Uh, it's not really 100% that if you get Prevotella, then you never get rid of it, but you are more likely to stay there for some time at least. But actually this stability properties is also something where we need to collect a lot of time series from big, big populations, and those studies are now only uh, ongoing. More questions? Yes. Thanks for an interesting talk. And um, you said uh, in your lecture that uh, like lowered biodiversity in gut microbiome can coincide with uh, arisal of many autoimmune diseases. But doesn't that also coincide with like a higher uh, detection rate and diagnosis of those diseases? Um, can you elaborate why it would? I mean, like a lot of those uh, autoimmune diseases are um, discovered and. Uh, get better known pretty lately. And uh, I think like even 30 or 50 years ago, they weren't as much uh, diagnosed in people. And, you know, compared to previous studies. Oh, okay, I see, I see. Yes, uh, for sure, um, many of those diseases are being diagnosed much more nowadays. But if we try to carry out a study, that study is a particular disease, we always need to have a control population also, and we try to compare two different populations, at least two different populations, to have some kind of idea. And for instance, um, these Finnish-Russian comparisons where we have also Estonia there, and we see the rise from the 90s in certain types of diseases. Um, these, um, these kind of cross-population comparisons give um, yeah, they can control some of those, those confounding variables. But what we would really like to do is actually to follow people over a long, long time intervals, uh, hopefully over the whole lifespan, to see how, how individuals actually change. Because uh, most of the studies at the moment are cross-sectional, and then you are comparing different types of people. And there is a lot of different uh, factors that could potentially explain the differences. And many of them we can never measure. We may not be able to control them at all because they are unknown. 
but if we measure uh, single individuals over long periods of time, then we can control many more of these factors. And if, if we do this in large populations, then uh, this helps. Uh, this kind of studies are now more and more carried out. So, so it's rather common uh, practice in this uh, statistics that there is kind of a survival uh, analysis tweak in the this uh, final analysis, so that some people die, and they are not in this uh, the later samples, <laughs> but you kind of uh, balance that phenomenon. So it's called survival analysis, and uh, it's a regular practice. So it's uh, in these long-term uh, studies, usu usual routine. Yeah, of course it is very clear you need to control whatever you can in these kind of studies. We, we try to be as careful as possible with controlling all the, all the variables, but um, of course there are always limitations how, how well you can do. Yes, one more question. Um, would it be possible that if, um, if there's a person that has poor diet and the poor diet leads to um, poor gut microbiome or very simple gut biome, um, then he or she receives a fecal transplant that then leads to a better gut bi microbiome and maybe they are happy with that for a while. But if they keep eating um, poor food, that essentially would lead to a poor gut. Like, does that happen actually? If you get a fecal transplant, and you, because that would kind of answer the question of whether uh, which is the egg and which is the chicken. So if you actually, if you manage to destroy your gut microbiome, but then you get a fecal transplant, but you keep eating poorly, as, assuming that that's the reason why you had a poor gut microbiome, is that so? Yeah, yeah, you, you can, <laughs> I mean, if you destroy your microbiome with bad food and then you heal it with fecal transplant and you keep on eating bad, then you can destroy it again. This is very clear. Um, um, I don't think this study specifically has been done, <laughs> but, but, I, mean, like but mice I, or I, I think there is no, uh, no reason why, it, why you couldn't destroy it again. <laughs> but what has been, like, uh, there was uh, recently a guy from Israel visiting uh, in Turku, actually, Eran Elinav. They have been doing studies with probiotics, and uh, sometimes people are recommended to take probiotics. After you have antibiotic treatment, you could eat probiotics to... Uh, make the gut microbiome heal more fast, but they showed that because probiotics is it's some kind of um, healthy bacteria that you eat to balance your microbiome, but actually it's uh, only particular types of bacteria that is not really the natural mix. And uh, they showed that actually if you eat probiotics after the antibiotic treatment, it could be that um, it takes much longer for you to restore the original levels. Let's see if there are more questions. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm wondering uh, how new species carry to the gut from the food. So, I mean, uh, if we grow vegetable, then they carry uh, their own. But, but uh, boiled vegetable or so everything, everything kills uh, in the food. Then only component nutrients can change. So then, possible that some species growing more and some species more less. So then balance changed, but sometimes you say the variety, total number of the species are changed. So that means uh, somehow carries through the mouth to stomach and survivor going to the as a new species. Yeah. So the question was if there is, a, if we get new microbes from food, and I think this is the case throughout the life. We are all the time receiving new microbial species from the environment, for instance, through food um, to, gut, to the gut. And um, most of them are very occasional visitors. Actually, if we look at gut microbiome composition, there is only a few bacterial types that are very common in our gut. And most of the bacteria that we can observe in the gut, they are very rare. They probably are only visiting. They came, they stay for a moment, 
but not necessarily very long. But then we may receive them later again from the environment, but they don't like to thrive in our gut, they just visit. And, um, and uh, this definitely happens. Everybody has a little bit different mixture because we are living in different places. We also, it's also a little bit random what kind of things we acquire from the environment and so forth. Um, but of course, one thing is also the observational limitations because uh, once we try to measure these system, systems, we can never measure everything that is there really. We can just take a limited uh, fecal sample for instance. Uh, it's uh, just uh, you have much more fecal material in your system. So if we take a snapshot, uh, just a couple of grams of fecal material, it's only a window to the what is there and it's probably a limited window. So there is al always this measurement uh, difficulty. We can only measure to certain resolution. Uh, so it could be that there are many bugs in tiny amounts in our guts all the time and we just don't see them. And then we do measurements later and then we can measure them because they became a little bit more abundant or we were uh, more lucky to just being able to observe those species in that new measurement. So there is two different things. There is real biological immigration from the environment and then there is the observational uh, uncertainty. Okay, I have a question, may, may be related or not. Um, you say that you are a mathematician or you have a mm. mathematician background. Yeah. And what are the diffi main difficulties in mathematical modeling of, of this type of uh, studies? Uh, um, I have no idea, but I, I guess, do you need to have um, a training as a mathematician? And if so, why? And what would, would it be the main... Uh, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's quite. It's very multidisciplinary research, and people from different backgrounds come to do this kind of research. And then, what background you exactly have will uh, influence a little bit how you do it, and what kind of choices you maybe make. There are many different difficulties because we need. Maybe, maybe the greatest difficulty is that we need a lot of different approaches uh, from different disciplines. We need to combine elements from statistics, uh, Bayesian probability and ecological models and complex system modeling and uh, data science and uh, like inform information processing and uh, all kinds of disciplines um, that are not traditionally very coherent set. And then um, it becomes a challenge to be able to understand many different disciplines well enough so that you can utilize the different approaches as you, as you need. Uh, if, you, if we look at the particular modeling types, the gut uh, microbiome, it's, it's an ecosystem. So uh, complex dynamic systems research is one area that is uh, used a lot, dynamical complex systems. Um, that's, that's one, but we need a lot more because already for the measurements and how to make sense of the DNA measurements and so on, then you need sequence analysis tools, uh, sequence alignment tools and uh, things like this that are very different algorithmically. So the variety of things, I think that's the greatest challenge. Interesting, thanks. So let's see if there are more questions. Yes. Yeah. You, you talked about this um, uh, test where uh, antibiotics and, and fecal transplant were kind of compared as a solution and uh, it looked like the fecal transplant was much more successful but are there any other medical treatment, medicine that can be used with instead of fecal transplant? <coughs> Yeah, it's 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 very good question. Actually, the whole field is basically now focused on on alternative ways to do these treatments. So, as I mentioned, already dietary change can can uh, be used as a treatment for certain kinds of things. Um, and fecal transplant is a very drastic change. You change the whole ecosystem at once with that. But we can also, instead of the whole ecosystem, we can focus on much more narrowly defined sets of species. Uh, we have, uh, for instance, in addition to fecal transplants, of course we have antibiotics. It's kind of opposite thing. We erase everything that is there. Although we can have very selective antibiotics that are very targeting very specifically only certain types of bacteria. But then we have probiotics and prebiotics. Probiotics is uh, basically referring to bacteria 
uh, liver bacteria or, or dead bacteria that um, that can live in your gut and uh, in certain cases the probiotics can um, can have beneficial effects for the gut balance. Prebiotics refers to types of uh, food or other dietary materials that promote the growth of certain types of bacteria. So it's not really new bacteria, but something that makes certain types of healthy bacteria live there more nicely. And the fecal, fecal transplants nowadays, uh, the, it's a huge uh, topic for studies now. If we could replace the fecal material, with some kind of cocktail that we can grow in a laboratory that would not be the whole fecal thing, but could contain a consortium of maybe 10 to 20 different bacterial species that would together do all the essential things. And if this could be provided as a pill, for instance, uh, it would be pretty handy. But all these things are now ongoing. So there is no direct replacement for the fecal transplant at the moment, but this is a really active area of study. Okay, more questions? Okay, I have one more. Um, what would it be in your field, uh, um, a discovery that you would consider very significant? At the moment, if you could wish that something, that you could discover something or that some one of your colleagues would discover something to have really a non-incremental step in your research, what would it be? Well, at the moment, we would like to understand how healthy microbiome is like. Because that's the fundamental baseline for understanding how to treat the disease. If we know what is healthy, then uh, we can try to find ways how to get into that. Why is it difficult to, to identify? Uh, it's, um, well, there are many reasons. And one reason is that health itself is extremely difficult to define. Uh, but of course we can look at different aspects of health. Um, and other thing is that people do not have a single type of microbiome. I, I was showing you that people may have different types of microbiomes. So healthy, maybe there is one, not one single healthy microbiome. Maybe there can be multiple different microbiome types that are all healthy in different ways or in the same way. Okay. That's, Thank yeah. you. Okay, then I don't know if there are no more questions. Um, then I just remind you that you will have now the opportunity, uh, if you want to just ask questions personally to Leo uh, in Finnish, for example, if you, or if you are shy and don't want to ask a question in public, he will be uh, staying with us, I think, for at least half an hour, probably. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so please uh, do um, go and ask, uh, ask him questions. Uh, this has been very interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you.